Hello everyone and welcome to another interesting endoscopic case showing the endoscopic drainage of a large pancreatic pseudocyst using the hot Axios system. I am joined by two of my consultant colleagues, Dr. Shafkat Mahmoud, who will be doing the endoscopic procedure, and Dr. Vanya Giljaka, who will be assisting. The patient is a 35-year-old lady with a history of paranoid schizophrenia for which she was taking long-term cotiapine. She smoked 20 cigarettes a day and drank alcohol very occasionally. Four months ago, she developed severe abdominal pain and subsequently developed jaundice and pruritus a week later. She self-medicated with Peptac and Buscopan. Two weeks later, that is three and a half months ago, she presented to the SDEC unit, which is the same day emergency care unit, with ongoing jaundice. The abdominal pain had settled. Blood tests showed a bilirubin of 133 micromoles per litre with an elevated ALT and alkaline phosphatase. A basic liver screen was negative for common viruses and her immunoglobulin levels were normal. An ultrasound scan performed on the same day showed multiple stones in the gallbladder and a dilated common bile duct. The patient was referred for an outpatient ERCP and discharged home. Here is the ultrasound scan showing what was described as a normal pancreas with stones in the gallbladder, a dilated common bile duct, undilated intrahepatic ducts and normal flow in the portal vein. Six weeks ago, the patient attended for her outpatient ERCP. By this time, her jaundice had settled and the bilirubin was down to 14 micromoles per litre, which is normal. The ALT was also back to normal and the alkaline phosphatase was still raised at 411. Because the jaundice had settled, an endoscopic ultrasound scan was done first. This showed the presence of stones in the gallbladder and surprisingly there was a walled off necrosis measuring 8 by 7 centimeters with inflammation of the pancreatic body and tail. The common bile duct was of normal caliber and there were no stones within it. Hence, an ERCP was not performed on that day and instead an MRCP was requested. She attended for her MRCP three weeks ago. This showed a 12 centimeter pseudocyst. There were stones within the gallbladder, but not within the common bile duct. There were some solid components within the cyst. Therefore, it may be a walled off necrosis rather than a pseudocyst according to Atlanta 2012 classification. In any case, there is a large fluid component and I'll continue to call it a pseudocyst for the purposes of this presentation. A week ago, she was seen in the gastroenterology clinic. She had been vomiting for a few days and there was upper abdominal pain. She had lost a considerable amount of weight and had dropped her dress size from 18 to 10. On examination, there was a tender epigastric bulge. A CT scan with contrast was performed on the same day. This confirmed a large 12 to 13 centimeter pseudocyst compressing the stomach. There was no evidence of a pseudoaneurysm on the CT scan. A week later, the patient attended for a hot axios drainage of the pseudocyst. Here we see the endoscopic ultrasound with Dr. Mahmoud on the echo endoscope. After passing the scope into the stomach, the pseudocyst is initially assessed. The cyst contains mainly liquid, but there are solid components within it. So as mentioned before, it could be classified as a walled off necrosis rather than a pseudocyst.
a stable scope position is found. The wall of the cyst is thin, certainly less than 10 mm. Doppler is used to assess for any overlying vessels. The posterior wall of the cyst is also interrogated for vessels. The endoscopic view shows a bulge on the posterior wall of the stomach. A good site is chosen for the placement of the stent. A word or two about the hot axial stent and electrocautery enhanced delivery system. The device comprises a handle and a catheter which has a hydrophilic coating. The tip of the catheter is cone-shaped and has two diathermy wires running longitudinally along the slope of the cone and attaching to a tiny metal ring at the very tip. There is a short black portion of catheter proximal to the nose cone which acts as a visual marker. The catheter is wetted and passed down the channel of the echo endoscope. A lure lock is used to connect the device securely to the scope. After the device has been lure locked into place, the handle can still be rotated. The handle of the device has a black hub and a grey hub situated midway up the handle. There is a lock switch for the black hub and a yellow safety clip and a lock switch for the grey hub. The black hub and the lower portion of the handle controls the catheter movement. The grey hub and the upper portion of the handle controls stent deployment. Under EUS guidance, the tip of the scope is placed at a suitable location so that the cyst is clearly visible with no intervening blood vessels in the wall at the proposed site of puncture. The wall thickness should be less than 10 mm. When ready, the diathermy cord is attached to the handle. The manufacturer recommends pure cut current. On an Irby 200D diathermy unit, we can use the auto cut mode effect 5 at a power setting of between 80 and 120 watts. The black hub is unlocked and under EUS guidance, the black hub is gently pushed downwards with the diathermic current on. The catheter should pierce the wall of the cyst and the catheter should be passed into the cyst for a distance of 3 to 4 centimeters. The black hub is now locked in position and the diathermic cable is detached to prevent accidental use. Next, the yellow safety clip is removed and the grey hub is unlocked. The grey hub is then moved upwards halfway up the handle until there is a click. This action deploys the distal flange of the stent which should be visible on endoscopic ultrasound. Next, the black hub is unlocked again and gently pulled upwards whilst visualizing the distal flange of the stent on ultrasound. The flange should move upwards and oppose against the wall of the cyst. When the flange starts to deform against the cyst wall, assuming an oval shape on ultrasound, stop moving the black hub and lock it into position again. Now slide the grey hub all the way to the top of the handle to deploy the proximal flange within the channel of the scope. The proximal flange will not be visible on EUS. Next, switch to the endoscopic view. Unlock the black hub and inflate the stomach. To release the deployed proximal flange from the scope, move the scope away from the stomach wall and push the black hub down in a one-to-one -one movement. The deployed proximal flange should now be visible on the endoscopic view. The Leo lock should now be unscrewed and the catheter removed. Let us now return to the case. 
we see the endoscopic view with the bulge visible on the posterior wall. In the room view, the hot axios catheter is lubricated with water and passed down the channel of the scope. The lure lock is used to securely attach the handle to the channel of the scope. For this case, we used a stent which had a diameter of 15 mm and a saddle length of 10 mm. The diathermy cable is attached to the Irby 200D diathermy unit set at autocut mode, effect 5, 100 watts. Final checks are made with the Doppler to ensure that there are no blood vessels in the way or in the opposite cyst wall. We're now ready for action. The black hub is unlocked and under EUS guidance, the black hub is gently pushed downwards with the diathermy on. The catheter can be seen piercing the wall of the cyst and it's passed into the cyst for a distance of three to four centimeters. The black hub is now locked in position and the diathermy cable is detached from the handle. Next, the yellow safety clip is removed and the grey hub is unlocked. The grey hub is then moved upwards, halfway up the handle until there is a click. This action deploys the distal flange of the stent which can be seen on the ultrasound. Next, the black hub is unlocked again and gently pulled upwards whilst visualizing the distal flange of the stent on ultrasound. The flange moves upwards and opposes against the wall of the cyst. The flange can be seen deforming against the cyst wall assuming an oval shape on ultrasound. At this point we stop moving the black hub and it is locked into position. Now the grey hub is moved upwards all the way to the top of the handle to deploy the proximal flange within the channel of the scope. The proximal flange is not visible on EUS. We now switch to endoscopic view and the stomach is inflated with CO2. The black hub is unlocked. To release the proximal flange of the stent from the scope, we move the scope away from the stomach wall and push the black hub down in a one-to-one -one movement. The deployed proximal flange was visible momentarily and there is a gush of cyst content into the stomach. The catheter is now removed and we suction away some of the stomach content. The proximal flange of the stent is not readily visible on endoscopic view. We therefore switch to a forward viewing gastroscope.
After a little searching, the proximal flange is located. The lumen of the stent is occluded by debris from the cyst. We now switch back to an echo endoscope and insert a jag wire through the axial stent and into the cyst. Finally, a 7 French by 5 cm plastic stent is placed coaxially through the axial stent to minimize the risk of further occlusion. The final EUS images show the correctly positioned axial stent and the endoscopic images show the plastic stent in situ. We plan to repeat the CT scan in three or four weeks. Finally, here is the team, minus our nursing colleagues, who were too shy to be in the picture. I hope you enjoyed this video. See you in the next one. Bye for now.